Good evening, everybody. Hey, how's it going? Excellent. Glad to see everyone. Thank you. One person's happy. Okay. <laughs> you okay? No, you look like really serious. Okay, you're good. Wrapped with attention. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, we're on week eight already. So, yeah, this is the two month mark. Uh, we only have, what, five lessons to go? Is that right? Something like that? Eight? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're uh, well over halfway at this point. So, uh,. Yeah, we are finishing up the book of 2 Peter tonight. So last week, Peter was talking about the reality of Jesus' return, and he's finishing up the letter by talking about the implications of his return. Uh, so last week was a little more doctrinal, and then this week, still doctrinal, but he gets to some of the implications of uh, what that should mean in our lives uh, so that's what we'll be talking about tonight, and why don't we pray and we can get started. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the time that we can spend in your word. I just pray you'd be with us during it, uh, that you would allow us to see whatever it is you have for us, uh, whether it's something we need uh, now in the immediate or something for the future. We just pray that your word doesn't return void, uh, that we get whatever uh, whatever you have for us in your word. We thank you for it. Thank you for this time. Pray you'd be with us. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. All right, so I'll just start off with the intro from your book. It says, Websites that help you plan your future abound. One in particular is called myfuture.com. The name of the site makes it sound like a person can visit it to find out what his future holds. In reality, it just gives tools to help a person plan college and career choices. Believers should plan for the future with careful diligence, not only for future years on earth, but also for endless years in eternity. Question one, is planning for the future a critical part of your job? If so, what might the consequences of failing to, uh, be of failing to plan? I don't know if this will apply to anyone. Is uh, anyone have a job like that? Any long-term plan, strategy, jobs going on? Yes, your weeks will go very poorly. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we got two. Excellent. So yeah, failing to plan for these futures will be problematic. Um, just this morning, I planned the music for May, you know. Otherwise, likewise, there would be chaos ensuing Sunday morning. I, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, just keep Catherine on her toes. Just call out a number in the hymnal. <laughs> Yeah, I've had quite a few dreams over the years of not being prepared for that, and it is terrible. <laughs> Especially when we first started using the projector. Uh, I was having stress dreams about that <laughs> leading up to it. Uh, question two. How much thought do you give to the future in your personal life? <laughs> so you have anxiety about the future in your personal life. Anyone else plan for the future, or...? Worry about the future? <laughs> Housing investments, that kind of, yeah. I don't know, in the business world, everyone wants you to have a five-year plan, right? They don't usually work out all that well. I mean, clearly some people, but anyone else ponder the future? Yeah, I go out of the, my way to, especially like the months leading up to uh, the end of the year. I give that a lot of thought for the year coming. Um, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, you know? Can't really know what God has in store for you or what, you know, you can just mess up along the way just fine on yourself without any other outside help. Um, yeah, okay. So 
Why don't we get to the text? Uh, we're going to be in Second Peter chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse... We might reread verse 9 for context. Yeah, we'll start in verse 9 and we'll go to the end. Um, Because remember, Peter is talking about the reality of Jesus' return and that his delay in returning is because of his patience and desire to have people saved. Uh, So verse 9, we read this last week. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye might be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. All right, good chunk of text there. A lot going on. Any, any cursory thoughts? Anything that jumps out at you right at the beginning? Yeah, you're terrified about missing the rapture ever since. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah, because this isn't that... Like, Peter dies around 66, 67, he's executed. And um, he mentions all his writings. So that doesn't mean that Paul is necessarily done writing every single thing or that Peter has everything. But everything that Peter knows of, and he knows this church is aware of them as well. He calls them scripture. He puts them right alongside um, the other scriptures of things that people misinterpret or intentionally misinterpret. Um, Yeah, that's a big deal. Okay, so that, that's a good segue into, uh, I want to talk about the first uh, verse 10. So, day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What would you describe the day of the Lord as? Like, like what, what is this term? Yeah, that's a good question. I probably should have anticipated that. Yeah, so let me tell you some of the Old Testament stuff first. Um, So the day of the Lord is not just a New Testament phrase that's used many times throughout the Old Testament. Um, It comes up first in Isaiah chapter 2. It comes up in Amos 5. I have Joel 2. Um, usually the day of the Lord in the Old Testament is referring to the day of God visiting the earth in judgment, typically. Um, So especially that Isaiah passage, even though there's, you know, when you read some of the prophets, you go, oh, they're talking about, you know, the Babylonians coming and destroying Judah in judgment, but there's something else going on. You know, they, they, they do this thing where they, you see the immediate context and then it projects out into something that's clearly bigger than the story being told right there. Um, so like Joel 2 talks about judgment, but then also talks about, that's where we get, where Paul gets the verse, you know, in the day of the Lord, 
you know, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Like, so you have this idea of judgment and the salvation of God in, in both, both these things are kind of at play. And it's, it's worth noting in Hebrew reckoning, when does a day start? Day starts at night, you know, like one day, you know, Genesis evening in the morning, it's the first day. Uh, the Jewish people reckon their days by the night, like the, the nighttime first and then into the next day, um, which seems odd to us, but it's kind of like how you talk about things at work. You know, 4.30 rolls around and you go, ugh, it's almost the end of the day, thank goodness. And you will, no, it's not even close to the end of the day. It's close to the end of your work day. And I think, especially in an agrarian society where you don't have electric lights, that it makes a lot of sense to... Yeah, the end of the day is when you're done working and, you know, kind of start the next day. So the day of the Lord will start with, starts with darkness and then the day dawns, you know, so you kind of have that, that image going on. Um, it's also in Zephaniah 1.8. Uh, so as Peter talks about it, he's, like Pastor said, he's condensing a lot because he's having a lot go on in this one day of the Lord. Um, so, actually, we'll, uh, yeah, okay, in your book on page 76. Yeah, let me make sure I got this right. Yeah, just the first paragraph under searching the scriptures. Uh, my book just has one little parenthetical to add, and I'll let you know. Uh, the day of the Lord is the future period of time in which the events of the tribulation period, Christ's return to earth, followed by his millennial reign, and the renovation of the universe will occur. This is just in my book. In its widest scope, it will include at least 1,007 years. Uh, the events of the day of the Lord are associated with Christ's return. Peter's focus on the day of the Lord is on the disappearance of the present heavens and earth and the appearance of the new heavens and new earth. This dramatic change will occur following the millennial reign of Christ. So, yeah, as Pastor said, Peter is... He's not being vague. He's just giving you a lot of information in a very short period of time. So as he talks about the day of the Lord in any capacity, he's encompassing... All those events he's encompassing the return of Christ he's encompassing um, the judgment of God on earth and then we'll talk about it more in detail he gets into the the new heavens and the new earth uh, which is the just total end of creation as we understand it uh, currently today uh, thief in the night as we briefly discussed That is a New Testament thing. That, that is a statement that comes up in the New Testament. I couldn't get all the references, but it's double digits the amount of time this comes up in the New Testament, this phrase. Uh, what, what does the thief in the night imply to you? Like, what, what do you think the idea is there? Unexpected? Catching you by surprise. Catching you by surprise. And not like a good thing. Right, you know, um, you can have other surprises that are great, you know. Um, what's that company that shows up to houses with enormous checks? Publisher's Clearinghouse. I don't know if they're actually real or they exist or like, I've never known anyone who's, who's got that. But uh, that'd be a surprise I'd be okay with. I don't know how it works. I don't know if you have to publish something or I don't know. But... Uh, Yeah? Hmm, okay. I know what we're doing when we get home. <laughs> um, yeah, so the implication is some sudden, terrible thing, something you didn't expect to happen, the thief in the night. Um, there's a lot of stuff, especially in the teachings of Jesus, when he mentions the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. He gives the idea of, like, you know, if, if the owner of the house had known when the thief would break in, you know, he would have been ready for it. Like, if, if only he had known um, this wouldn't have occurred in this way. 
because we find out while this terminology is used often because it's usually talking about the destructive angle of the day of the Lord, like for Christians, it's not supposed to be that way. Uh, it's not supposed to be this as a thief in the night. And I don't think that means, oh, Christians are going to be able to figure out exactly when it's going to happen. Uh, but Paul in First Thessalonians 5, he says like, yay, I want, I want you to know sort of the signs of the time, but more be confident in your salvation, uh, in your relationship with Christ, so that that day doesn't overtake you like a thief in the night. Uh, Paul's the only one in that letter who kind of flips the idea that the thief in the night, that, that's, this is a world, that, that's the world's problem in a sense. Uh, for Christians, it shouldn't be this sudden tragic occurrence because that's, that's not uh, the destiny for, for Christians. Um, yeah, and more in, we need to move past verse 10. Um, but as he's giving this whole big day of the Lord, the heavens and the earth uh, pass, shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So he's giving you a whole cosmos here. Uh, so heavens, uh, when, when he talks about elements, these are typically, the Greek word that he's using is implying like space stuff, uh, not elements as we think of them on the periodic table. Uh, so like he's talking like stars and planets. Um, so he's saying like the heavens, the things in the heavens, and then he says the earth and like the, all the works done on the earth. So he's just giving you a whole totality picture of the end of all things, heaven and earth. Uh, but let's move to verse 11. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Um, now, I, I guess I can ask you your thoughts on this. I didn't really write much down on this verse. I wrote perhaps memorize this verse, definitely meditate on it, um, and just kind of consider the question that is posed. Um, you know, I kind of wrote down the questions for myself, like, what things are you laboring in that will one day be pointless? Or, you know, what actionable steps can I take today to be who I should be in light of the day of the Lord? Um, I don't expect us to delve into these like existential type questions in in this setting, uh, but I mean, any those are my only thoughts on the verse besides deep meditation that I can do later. Anyone have uh, anything that that they think about with this verse? <laughs> what? <laughs> I have no idea what that is. <laughs> what 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 is this prayer tower? Was that the IHOP guy? Sweet. <laughs> okay. Huh. I see. That's a shame. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's the important stuff. Yeah, I mean, from those few sentences, it sounds like he fits Second Peter pretty well. So you know, maybe Peter would be critical, possibly. Um, okay, so Ron's not building a prayer tower. Any uh, anything else that just like comes to you with this verse? Good Christian virtue of temperance. Yeah, that's good. No, no, of course that's true, um, and I think. Yeah, if you read that verse and you say, oh, wow, the only thing that matters is prayer and fasting and reading the word and being in church service 24-7, then you just, like, you've missed the rest of the Bible, too. Um, because, yeah, we're not spiritual beings. We're, like, we're, you know, uh, what's the term that they use? Like, 
I'm drawing a blank. There's a very technical term that basically is like, you know, you are a union of body and spirit. You're not like a spiritual being trapped in your earthly body so that only these high-minded philosophical theological things are worthy. Um, man is made for work. You know, like that's noble. Um, that's godly. That's kingdom type stuff. Relationship. Uh, you know, lot, lots of different stuff. Um, yeah, so it's not just your Bible memorization and making sure you read in the original Greek that's like, you know, the pinnacle of creation, only thing worthy to stand on the day of the Lord. Uh, but yeah, let, let's move to verses 12 and 13. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Uh, nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Some of that's treading old ground that we just went over about general flammable nature of the universe. Um, but anything jump out at you with that? Or any questions? Yeah, so it, it's tricky to know exactly what Peter's condensing and what he's not. Um, so the full... Uh, if you if you take Peter and try to like map it onto Revelation, um, which is a much more extensive outline of that, um, the full like judgment in fire and then recreation, um, to my understanding, seems to be after the millennial reign. Um, so while like because during that millennium, uh, the earth is not quite its new creation that it will be for like all eternity. Um, but of course, it's in a different state because you have an actual reign of Christ, and it's you know, so it's a different thing going on. But yeah, no, that's a good question because yeah, Peter is not—he's just not. Uh, whether he, you know, you were talking last week about like what does Peter know without revelation in front of him? And of course, it's the Holy Spirit's work doing this, so that it's it's hard to. I can't scramble that question, you know, in my own head. Um, but yeah, he, he's not doing a, a very detailed analysis here. He's just kind of giving you the general, like, here's what's coming, be ready, in a sense, you know. But yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, so he, well, and that's the thing, too. Like, we know Christ talked a lot about end time stuff with his apostles, and we have some of it. Like, we talked about the Olivet Discourse last week. Um, but yeah, what they knew beyond that, like, I have no idea. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm trying to remember, I was, I was actually reading an excerpt of Enoch last week, and it mentioned uh, the, the end of the age and this like, similar, um, similar like, just end times judgment, uh, like new creation type thing, um, you know, that the age to come as the Second Temple Jewish people would talk about it. Um, see, I don't know exactly where Peter's getting it from, but it's interesting. Okay, so uh, I did want to draw your attention to, in verse 12, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. Um, so, I was thinking about that word like, hasting unto the coming of the day of God. So, there are two lines of thought that I've come across in the commentaries where basically some people say like, oh, hasting unto the day of God is like, you know, maybe like anticipating, you know, like looking ahead to it, looking, you know, looking for the return of God. Um, others talked about the idea that Christians could have an effect on it coming sooner. Uh, they referenced the prayer of Daniel for God to like hasten to fulfill his promise to restore Israel. Um, you know, thy kingdom come, John's, even so, come Lord Jesus. And then they, so like they talked about prayer having influence on this possibility. And the, Paul refers to this age as the time of the Gentiles and the idea that evangelism can play a role in this um, because like he, God is patiently waiting for those to be saved I'm just telling you this because uh, I, I looked just like a few 
translational differences where I'm like, oh, people take different views on this. Some like just straight up commentaries where some people use this exact wording and take both approaches. I find the first one more likely, like anticipating the coming of the Lord. Um, yeah, I don't know. The uh, Father's the only one who knows the time. I don't know how we could have any influence on that, but just letting you know the idea is out there. So I uh, wanted to point that out. Um, and also, you kind of see, I'm going to say like the carrot and the stick in Peter's talk about the day of the Lord. Uh, I guess you have the stick, which is like the world being consumed and destroyed. But then he brings in the Christian hope that is new creation, new heavens and the new earth. Um, so it's not just, oh, cool, everything ends up in fire and we're off, you know, in some celestial cloud floating harp playing place somewhere else. Um, yeah, God is restoring, recreating, renewing uh, new heavens and new earth. Of course, that that's how Revelation ends with the... Uh, New Jerusalem, the, the city of God, descending onto the earth, and there's a lot, a lot of imagery going on there. Um, yeah, so like the eternal state is sort of here on earth, sort of not here on earth, um, in the same way that like, you know, if you compare it to your own personal salvation, I think that's pretty good. Like Paul talks about, hey, what's planted in the ground, talking about your death, your, your body, you know, it's, ra it's, it's planted mortal, it'll be raised immortal. So it's like, uh, Paul kind of uses the language of like, is the seed the same as the plant that comes from it? Like, yes and no, but the plant is obviously something of a much different substance. Um, yeah, God is planting something mortal, raising something immortal, um, and something similar seems to be happening with the earth, destroyed in fire, recreated new for his purposes. Um, and then just the last part of verse 13 about the new heavens and the new earth, that is the place wherein dwelleth righteousness. Uh, we don't have to say a lot about that, but that is like, that's one reason hell exists. It's not the only reason hell exists. Um, again, in Revelation, the imagery there is you have the city of God and everything vile is outside the city. It's sort of like this, uh, this image going on where it's like, man, wouldn't it be great if the world was perfect? And it's like, well, yeah, but who can be a part of that, you know? Uh, so if you actually want a place where there is just righteousness, anything unrighteous has to be outside of that. Uh, and that's why we follow Christ clothed in his righteousness, not our own. Otherwise, uh, there's nothing we can do with that. Um, but we don't need a full gospel presentation in the middle of Second Peter chapter 3. Um, all right, I'll read verses 14 through 16 and then give you guys a chance to talk. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, you look forward to such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. All right, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning, but any, any thoughts on those verses? Yes. Yeah, he is being uh, dense, you know. He's writing a short letter, but it is packed. And also just some of the ways that, like, Greek works. They can do these massive run, like to, in English, it would be these massive run on sentences um, where, like, sometimes Paul does the same thing where you look at that and you go, wow, that is terrible English. It's really good Greek, but it's terrible English, you know? 
Yeah, because so clearly he allows for a distinction, right? Um, like he goes, okay, some stuff Paul writes about, it's, it's hard to understand. People mess this up. Those people, it's like, okay, that's why I'm writing. That's why, like, that, this is why we teach, we preach, because some things are just, they're hard to understand. But yeah, chapter two, if you're intentionally doing this, he is just guns blazing. Uh, so there's a big difference between, yeah, intentional heresy and just honest questioning and misunderstanding. Uh, there's, there's room for that. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, what is this phrase? The, the patience of God is salvation. Is that what he says? Oh, the long suffering. Um, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a tricky thing. Like, as Christians, you know, and, and you're told to, like, long, look forward to the day of the Lord, to, to the coming of Christ. Um, but then it's also like, eh, but you got a ton of people in your life that you're probably praying for, like, for salvation. It's like, Okay, like, it, sometimes it's hard to take John's approach and say, like, oh, yeah, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Um, yeah, it's tricky. And obviously, God is dealing with this same idea because he is long-suffering and he's, he's allowing a lot of time. But, yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, yeah, I'll just point out, so, if Peter's given priority to anything with this teaching in verse uh, 14... Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Uh, if we recall, in chapter 2, when he was talking about the teachers, he was saying they are, uh, what, spots and blemishes, in contrast to First Peter, when he talks about Christ as the lamb without spot or blemish. Um, and he uses a slightly different word here, but it's in keeping with Old Testament words about the, the lamb of God. Um, without spot and blameless. So he's calling people like, be diligent, make sure, you know, it's kind of like, make sure you are, ste- you, you are sure, steadfast in your faith, be without spot and blameless. Like that's his big takeaway from his day of the Lord stuff. Um, and yeah, it's interesting that he uses the same terminology. And like, we understand this because of imputed righteousness. We have the righteousness of Christ if we are his um, he uses the same language, basically, to talk about those in Christ as he yet does to talk about Christ himself. And that's, that's a pretty beautiful image. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, the need for real salvation, the need to surrender and follow. Okay, I want, to write, I want to read you a chunk that is not in your book. It's sort of in your book, but sort of not. But then I will get to something that is in your book. So why don't you turn to page 80? And you don't need to look at it yet. Just, just hang out on page 80, and I'll tell you when to jump in. <laughs> okay? All right. So just, just for me. In 2 Peter 3.15, Peter refers to a letter that Paul wrote to the same people who are receiving this letter from Peter. Um, Paul wrote to these Christians to remind them to live in light of Christ's return. The two apostles are in agreement in the messages they preach. The letter by Paul to which Peter refers may be one of his letters that's now part of the New Testament, or it may be another letter that was especially addressed to him, addressed to them. Paul wrote with the wisdom that God gave him. He taught believers to live in expectation of the Lord's return. He also addressed the long-suffering of God in the present time as an expression of God's goodness to sinners, Romans 2.4. Paul wrote with God-given wisdom. He wrote some things that are difficult to understand about subjects such as the triune Godhead, predestination, election, sanctification, to name a few. Paul wrote as God's penman and therefore was a channel of special revelation. The scriptures were written for our understanding, 2 Timothy 3.16. God's word can be understood, but its study requires our effort in dependence upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The study of God's word requires diligence and careful attention to the words of the text so that we will correctly interpret it. Okay, now this is in your book in full. There's a paragraph that starts with, There is a world of difference. 
between distorting scriptures and misunderstanding them. The skeptics twist Paul's writing, as well as the rest of scriptures, out of shape and in deliberate attempts to make the biblical text say something other than what it means. The Bible is not God's voice if it only says what men want it to say. Peter affirms that Paul's writings are scripture. And uh, just fun fact, that word that they translate as rest, they, they rest scripture. In the Greek, it's, very, it's like torture, you know, they, which we still use, uh, like maybe you guys don't use it. In theological circles, like if they're doing, if someone's doing a sermon review of something, they'll be like, oh, he is just torturing that, that verse. Like, you know, just destroying, you know, the original meaning or context or misunderstanding it in a way that is just irretrievable. Um, yeah. Okay. We got like 10 minutes left. Okay. 17 and 18, I'll get your thoughts, and we will end Second Peter on this. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. All right. Last two verses. Any thoughts? Yeah, because he said quite a few times, like, you know these things. You know, he, the, his letter was not much, probably not much new information to them that they hadn't learned through Paul, through contact with the apostles and different Christians. Yeah, and he, he says that a few times. Yeah, it's crazy how early that happens, right? Like, again, 66, 67, this would have had to be written, probably 66 or maybe a little earlier, but... Yeah, and you already have, like, many false prophets. Uh, that, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So, like, when you read uh, 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking about these, like, self-styled apostles who are not of the actual 12, and um, they seem to be doing great for themselves. And like Peter is talking about these people who are clearly doing like whatever, whatever way they're twisting scripture so that they gain financially from it. All the real apostles die, except for John, who, I mean, he does die, but not from martyrdom. Um, yeah, the real apostles physically had a hard life. Some of these fake apostles... By worldly standards, they're doing pretty good, apparently. Yeah, anything else in these verses? So you're basically taking the Harvey Dent in the Dark Knight approach, like live long enough to see yourself become a villain. <laughs> We're just all doomed for failure if we live long enough. <laughs> well, and again, this is why a few weeks ago we talked about framing of like, you know, is Christianity just something you do on Sundays. And I know like in your, your prayers up front, you know, you address that kind of stuff a lot about like Christians every day. Um, but yeah, even in, in the church, like the church, um, yeah, like it, it's not, you know, it's not a moral code. It's not just a social club. It's not something you do on Sundays. It's like uh, we talked about weeks ago. Um, yeah, it's a kingdom and people choose to defect. And it's like, if, if we, maybe if we use some more of Peter's language, you know, uh, maybe we should bring back the word apostate more often, or, uh, you know. Uh, yeah, because it's not, it's not nothing to just let your Christianity fade away. Um, now, that being said, good transition. Notice what Peter does and doesn't say when he says, uh, Okay, beware, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Now, I think last week we said that, okay, Peter's writing to a church, and he's writing to a church that he, he doesn't believe they have fallen into significant error in and of themselves. He sees serious danger from the wolves in sheep's clothing 
among the flock. Uh, the, the heresies have not seemed to have heavily infiltrated the church, but it's a remember what you know, be on guard. He, he warns them about falling from their steadfastness. Um, so again, we've said probably it's come up in every single time we've done, you know, every single series at some point. You know, we believe if you're in Christ, you're a new creation, you're a child of God, um, callings of God are without repentance. Like, you don't lose, if you are actually a child of God, you don't lose that. Uh, you don't get saved and then lose your salvation. But he's as concerned that Christians lose their steadfastness, that kind of thing. Like, you know, the, the whole James, faith without works is dead. Like, okay, you can still be a Christian and be a worthless servant. You know, like that, that is a real possibility, um, which is not good. And Peter's basically writing a whole letter to be like, hey, don't, don't let your doctrine, don't let the things you believe about God, don't fall prey to these false teachers. Not necessarily because they'll lose their salvation, although I think when these, if these Christians turn to it, they'll end up preaching a gospel that will not save. Like that, I think that's true. Um, the more they pervert it. But yeah, he's, he's really concerned that the Christians, they keep bearing fruit. They don't just become like a you know, worthless servant to use Jesus' parable. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, and that's the thing. The judgment of God is a blessing. Like, it, it's a good thing. Uh, it's funny. I was thinking about the difference between how we consider two words that mean virtually the same thing, virtually, but... So justice, you think, oh, God is going to bring justice. Oh, amazing. That, that's a good thing, justice. Everyone likes that word. Judgment, when they say God's going to bring judgment, we go, oh, that's horrible. That's a, what a mean God. You, go, like, you realize that's the same thing, right? Like um, when a judge passes judgment, if he's a good and righteous judge, he is upholding the innocent, or the, the, the a victim, or, you know, whatever the thing is, he, he's righting a wrong, and it's only if you're the person that's in the wrong, you know, you go, oh, gosh, this judgment is horrible. If you're in the right, a right judgment is, is to your favor, but we don't think about them the same way. It's hard to say what that's about. Um, there, there's a few, a few ways you could go with it. It's in, for, uh, I think, First Thessalonians? Or first or second? Uh, they're similar content. Yeah, first or second Thessalonians. Um, yeah, that could be a falling away from the faith, like a, as a general, like large scale apostasy. Um, the word can also be translated rebellion. And uh, as it's talking about the man of sin at the time, it, it could have political implications. It, it, he's not very clear about it. And I think you have to plug it into Revelation and try to work that out. But it's, I don't know that I have a good answer for you. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's a good question, though. That's a good question. Um, okay, so, yeah. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Um, yeah, excellent way. He ends his letters much more concisely than Paul does. He's not saying hi to as many people. Um, yeah, okay, so that is Second Peter. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that and got something from it. Um, probably not a letter you're as familiar with or weren't as familiar with. So, yeah, good. Next week we will start Second John, everyone's favorite letter. So uh, we'll dig into that and see what that's all about. Um, yeah, okay, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this night. I thank you for... Being able to study your word, being able to understand your word, and uh, being able to discuss it, I just pray that you would take uh, that, that we would take the lessons here, uh, the impact that your word can have. Lord, uh, let us uh, just really consider Peter's words, uh, the Spirit's words, and uh, help us to orient ourselves rightly, uh, knowing uh, the fate that will befall uh, the earth the world, both in uh, judgment and in recreation. Uh, we thank you for that, that promise of the future. 
I would just pray you'd be with us. Bring us back safely next week. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen.